but I want to highlight the three primary principles. You find them all through the New Testament. They're restated in different ways, but it's the same three principles of how we can cooperate with the grace of God, with who we are in Christ, in order to walk out, to have power to walk out the eight Beatitudes. Roman number one. Paragraph A, God requires us to cooperate with His grace. Meaning He doesn't just give us the grace of God and then put us on automatic pilot. He freely gives us His grace, then He requires a relational interaction with Him in order for the grace to be activated in our mind and our emotions. The grace is ours freely and forever in our legal position. God has affection for us, no condemnation. We have the authority to use the name of Jesus. We have the indwelling spirit. Whether we ever use it or not, it is ours permanently, instantly. But in order for us to enjoy the benefit of it, God requires that we participate with the Holy Spirit in a relational way. We talk to Him. He inspires us, and our mind and our emotions become renewed. We deny fleshly lust, and we know who we are in Christ. I'll go through all of that one, two, three in a systematic way. It's very possible to receive the grace of God and to receive it in vain, which means you can receive it, but it doesn't cause your mind and emotions to be different. Beloved, if I'm receiving the grace of God and I'm going to enjoy it for billions of years, I want my mind and emotions to be renewed by the power of it in this age. We can neglect to cooperate. We can live in spiritual brokenness, that's a negative thing, throughout our Christian life living in defeat with sorrow over our defeat but living in it I don't want to live that way I want to participate with the Holy Spirit in order to activate the wealth that's freely given to me by Christ Jesus there's a division of labor God will do God will not do our part and we can't do his part I'm gonna say that again there's a division of labor in the grace of God some people in a it's wrong it's sincere but it's sincerely wrong they want god to do their part i mean the part that god sovereignly called them to do the analogy i've used over the years is the same one it's the farmer god provides the sun and the rain and the process of life the miracle of life that's in the seed the farmer has to plant the seed, water the seed, and weed the seed. Take the weeds. The farmer could stay in bed all day and say, Oh God, I trust you to plant my seeds and pull the weeds. And God will say, No. If you don't plant the seed and pull the weeds, you will starve without a harvest, even though I will keep sending the sunshine and I will send the rain, but you will die of starvation. And a lot of people say, if God wants it done, he'll do it. God has made it clear what his part is and what our part is. And the reason he wants us to have a part, it's to be involved relationally with him because he values the relationship with us that much. We're not earning the power of God but it's a relational value where he requires interaction with us in the name of love. It's because he, require, he values relationship. Some people think that any effort we do is earning it. No, the effort we exert, we're putting effort because we value the relationship of love. And God requires that we respond in love. That we dialogue with the Spirit. That we believe his word. Those are all statements of love. Now I'm going to outline three principles in a moment. And again, they're so succinctly put right here in Romans chapter 6. Now Romans chapter 6 
is the most dynamic chapter in the New Testament on living the transformed life. If you don't know that, if that's new to you, make a note. Romans 6 is the most important chapter in the New Testament on living the transformed life, meaning victory over sin from our heart. If you put Matthew 5, the eight Beatitudes, Matthew 5, the definition of love, loving God, you put Matthew 5 with Romans 6, beloved, you're going to have a dynamic combination. Matthew 5 with Romans 6, but they don't work separate from each other. Now the verse, paragraph B, the verse before Romans 6. This is what introduces Romans 6. It's the verse right before Romans 5.21. Paul said this. In the same way that sin reigned in death, in the same way that we were under the reign of sin, is what he's saying. Before we were born again, every one of us were under the reign of sin. That means we were under condemnation. We didn't have the Holy Spirit. We didn't have the authority to use the name of Jesus, etc. But in the same way that we were fully under the reign of sin, before we're born again, even so, we are now fully under the reign of grace the day we're born again. We are under the reign of grace. We are free from the reign of sin. It happened in one moment the day you were born again and you received the righteousness of Christ and you became a new creation. Being under the reign of sin was a position before God of every unbeliever under condemnation powerless to resist sin at the heart level no authority to withstand Satan etc etc paragraph D you are now under the reign of grace now Romans 6 is the next ver the next chapter right after this verse this verse goes together with Romans 6 I'd, I'd like to slip it into Romans 6 but they won't let me that was a joke okay Paragraph D, we're under the reign of grace. This is so remarkable. But remember, you can only experience it in this life if you actively cooperate with these principles. You can have this great wealth and still live in spiritual brokenness. You can be the, 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 the uh, beggar living under the bridge with the great inheritance but that you never use. The analogy we used in the last session. Under the reign of grace, we received a new position. We received a new power. We received a new nature, the divine nature in our spirit. We received new insights. The Holy Spirit shows us the word of God. We have a new destiny that's, that God honors forever. We received so much wealth the day we were born again. I say it a different way. Look at this in paragraph D. We're enjoyed by God, indwelt by the Spirit, empowered, and commissioned. Those three words, those four words, enjoyed, indwelt, empowered, and commissioned. Those are the four words where I summarize the things I've been saying about the, the reign of grace. I'm enjoyed by God. I'm indwelt by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, commissioned by God. Beloved, what wealth, what a... What an inheritance to walk out. Now let's look at number two, being dwelt by the Holy Spirit. This is the one that I mentioned in the last session. I want to spend a little bit of time developing how practically you can overcome sinful desires and sinful impressions and promptings that rise up in your mind and they rise up in your body and they rise up in your emotions. I mentioned in the last session that the day you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your spirit. Like that burning bush, that Shekinah glory, that's the same as the burning bush. The Shekinah glory is the Holy Spirit, the fire of God, 
and more. But that's the Shekinah glory. It's that burning bush of Moses. Matter of fact, in the Solomon's temple in the Old Testament, in the Holy of Holies, that Shekinah glory, that burning bush glory of God dynamic was in the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament temple. Now that burning bush, that fire of God dynamic, that real person of God is dwelling in your spirit. Your spirit, man, is now the Holy of Holies. You receive that as a free gift, as part of the wealth of what Jesus did for you in the cross. But if you don't dialogue with that person, if you don't actively relate to him, you're not going to activate the benefits of your wealth in your everyday life, in your mind, emotions, and will. Look at Galatians 5.22. I'm still under number two here. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. I want to focus, there's nine. These are the result of the Holy Spirit's power living in your spirit. This power is yours in your spirit man. Now remember, you don't feel your spirit man with your five senses. The only way you know you have a spirit, the only way you know the Holy Spirit lives in your spirit, there's only one way you know, the Word of God teaches us this and we believe it. And if we believe it, then we talk to the Holy Spirit, we thank Him for the truth of His ministry and presence in us, even before we feel Him, because we believe it, we talk to Him as though what God says about Him is true, because it is true, and we thank Him for the presence, His presence in us, and we thank Him for the implication of His presence in us. I'm going to break that down in a minute. For instance, in my spirit is the Holy Spirit. Same with you. The Holy Spirit is full of peace. Again, my emotions and my mind, my soul, my soul's my mind, emotions, and will, my soul does not have peace in it naturally. My body does not have peace in it naturally. There is supernatural peace actually dwelling in my spirit, but I can't measure it with my five senses. I can only believe it because God's word says it. So here's what happens. Anger rises up in my emotions. Now before I had the Holy Spirit living in me, I just had to wait for either five minutes, five hours, or five days, whatever it is, for that emotional storm to lift. Because anger will only, it will only, uh, uh, be like a storm for a short time, and then it dissipates and it comes back again. That's how it is for all the unbelievers around the world. Well, as a believer, that old familiar feeling of anger rises up in me. Or pride. I'll just stick with anger. If I will pause right then, instead of gritting my teeth and going, Oh, don't be angry, don't be angry, don't be angry, don't be angry. There's no power in doing that, by the way. It might keep you out of jail, but there's no power in doing it. There's no power in your emotions by gritting your teeth and going, don't say nothing, don't say nothing, just leave the room, don't say nothing, just leave the room. I've done that over my, in my day. But if I will talk to the Spirit, now listen, this is really simple and really powerful. This next two minutes will change your life if you buy it and do it. Very simple, but so few people that I talk to actually do this. If an anger rises up in you, and you know you don't want to go there, so you grit your teeth for that second, if you will turn your attention of your mind to that person who lives in your spirit, he's full of peace. He says, if you talk to me, I'll release the peace into your emotions, your soul. So I stop. And again, I'm going to say it a little bit more technical than I actually do it. So I look at that burning bush of Moses, the Shekinah glory of God, the Holy of Holies, like a consuming fire. That's the picture I have. The real Holy Spirit, again, it's not, it's not just a symbolism. He's there. He is God. And I look right at him in my mind's eye, and I say to him, 
Thank you, Holy Spirit, for peace. It's that simple. Instead of gritting my teeth and my attention focused outward on the guy making me mad and how much trouble I will get in if I don't shut up, I don't focus my attention outward. I focus my attention inward to a person. I don't ask him to help me. I thank him that he's there in me. Thank you for peace. You can peace, patience, kind of, if you pick the one you want, nine fruit of the Spirit. And here's the miracle. Now I challenge you to try it. You will find out it will work. What will happen is the anger in your emotions will dissipate real rapidly. You lock your mind on the Holy Spirit. Thank Him for peace. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for supernatural peace. The emotions that you, of anger that you grit your teeth and try to get rid of, but it will never leave until it naturally leaves over day, uh, minutes or hours or whatever, it will instantly go. Whoa! First time I did this some years ago. I go, Holy Spirit, thank you for peace. The anger lifted. I went, wait a second. I'm going to go get angry again and try that again. I'm going to see if that works. The truth is I actually did that. I went to somebody and just bothered them. I have five sisters. Guess who I went to? They said something real mean back. It didn't work because I was so excited anyway, so it didn't, the whole thing fell flat. But, but I had many times to work it over the next 30 years. So somebody will say some really insulting word. A good friend, an enemy, doesn't matter who. You are so this, in your natural anger. And I'll stop for one second. Turn my attention inward. Say, thank you, Holy Spirit. Don't give me peace. I have it. You dwell there. I am the righteousness of God, Christ Jesus. You live in me as a flaming fire. Thank you for peace. It is remarkable. The emotion lifts. Beloved, you can do that with various fears. You can do that with frustration. You can do that with the need for guidance. Not that the guidance instantly comes. But it comes over time. You can talk to that person inside of you. It's remarkable because, see, here's what happens. When negative emotion, you can do it with lust. You can do it with anger, lust, frustration, anxiety. If you will stop and talk to that person, you now have the ability to challenge the negative emotion in your heart. But before the Spirit lived in you, you had, no, you had no supernatural power in you to challenge that negative emotion. You had to not walk out the lust, not walk out the bitterness, not walk out the anger. Grit your teeth, try not to do it, try not to say it. In a little while, it passes you think, oh, I made it. Beloved, you're not going to make it very many times by gritting your teeth. Eventually, or mostly, you will vent the anger. You will express the pride. You will walk out the lust. Because you can only grit your teeth and stay away from it so long. But if you interact with a person in you that is holiness and righteousness, you have lustful feelings, you'll turn your attention inward, and you say, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are purity. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for self-control. Not asking for it. He is it. And you talk to Him, and that feeling will change in your emotion. Now, here's the problem. The feeling won't stay there permanently. The negative emotion will come back again. Maybe 10 minutes later, maybe 10 hours later, you have to draw on the Spirit again by talking to Him. The negative emotion will come back again the next day. You talk to Him, Holy Spirit, thank you for peace, and the anger will lift. An hour later, anger hits you, thank you, Holy Spirit, for peace, the anger lifts. And little by little, your mind and your emotions actually get renewed. So you end up with much less anger over time. I don't know if the anger ever leaves entirely in the full sense, but I know this, your mind and emotion get renewed by taking who you are in Christ in the Word, saying it to the Holy Spirit with a thank you that it's true. Your emotions get freed for that minute, 
Then later on, they're freed again when you try it again. Then later on that day, it happens again. Then over weeks and months and years, your character dynamically changes. It really does. Let's look at top of page 35. <coughs> now don't worry. Some of you go, I wonder if this works. You're going to have a chance before tonight is over to work to practice this. I promise you, you will have a chance real soon. If that guy next to you is kind of acting weird, you got the chance right now to look at him and say, what on earth? And just say, Holy Spirit, thank you for peace right now. You can. I there are always a couple weird people doing things in meetings and crazy and bugging five rows of people all around them. So just draw on the Spirit. Don't look at him and go, oh, why doesn't somebody make him stop? Stop. Don't do that. Well, that's not a horrible thing to ask. But in your spirit, Say, Holy Spirit, I mean, you can do it now. You don't have to wait till the end of the meeting. Praise God for that guy. Anyway, let's look at Roman number two. I want to again introduce to you Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six, by anybody who knows the New Testament, even a little bit, you will know Romans six is the primary chapter on personal transportation, uh, transformation. Probably transportation too from darkness to light. Ah okay. Thank you. Okay, that was reaching, that was stretching, I admit it. I was gonna like say, thank you Holy Spirit, but I can imagine him saying, don't blame that one on me, don't do that. Okay, back to the Bible here. The other chapter I would throw in to Romans 6 would be John 15. I would throw John 15, Romans 6. Those together really are the combination to walk out Matthew 5, the eight Beatitudes. The transformed life. Here it is. Romans 6 has three sections. A, our legal position. You can read that later. B, go down the page. Verse 11 to 13. These are the three principles that we cooperate with grace. This is what we're going to look at in a minute. We're going to look at each one of the three for just a minute each. A couple minutes each. Verse 14 to 23 is our living condition, what we will experience. Paragraph C, chapter 6, 14 to 23, describes the inward transformation of our emotions that we will experience if we do paragraph B, verse 11 to 13. If you will do these three principles consistently, I don't mean 100% consistently. Nobody does anything 100% consistently. But if you do these three principles as the rule of your life, you will stumble sometimes, you won't follow through sometimes if you're like me. But I mean as the rule of your life. I want to make this practical. It's within our reach. If you will do paragraph B, you will experience paragraph C. All of this is based on paragraph A, verse 1 to 10, who you are in Christ. That was what we talked about ever so briefly in our last session. We talked about who you are in Christ. Paragraph A, chapter 6, 1 to 10, restates the new creation realities in a more dynamic and elaborate way than the passage I used. But I'm not going to take time to go through it. Paul says the same truths, but even in a more dynamic way in chapter 6, verse 1 to 10. So let's look at chapter 6, three sections. I'm going to say it again. First section, who we are in Christ, our legal position. Paragraph B, second session, section, the three principles of how we can interact with the Holy Spirit so we can activate the wealth of grace in our emotions and in our mind. Paragraph C, what we can expect to happen in our transformed character over time. Okay, let's look at the three principles now that we find in chapter 6, verse 11 and 13. Principle number one. I call it the knowing principle. 
Paul said this in chapter 6 verse 11. At first it might sound a little strange, but you'll get familiar with the language because the language is, it's backed up throughout the whole New Testament. But if, if this is new to you, you might say, what? Here's what he says. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Now the word reckon yourself, that's the New King James. That is the same idea as know. Know this about you. Or you might use the word, see yourself as dead to sin and alive to God. The first principle, it's critical and it's overlooked by so many people. It's really what I talked about in the last session. Knowing the wealth you possess as a new creation in Christ. Paul is saying, you have to see yourself alive to God, meaning indwelt by the Spirit. You have to see yourself as enjoyed by God. You have to see yourself as possessing the authority of Jesus. If you don't see this about you, you will have a very difficult time on principle two and principle three. Most believers that I know skip principle one. And this is one of the biggest reasons Principle two and three do not work effectively in their life. And I'm going to break that down for you. We have to see ourselves in agreement with how God sees us as the new creations in Christ. In other words, to see the truths of what we covered in the last session, even though we covered them very, very briefly. Paragraph B. First, see yourself alive to God. See yourself alive to God. Yes, you are enjoyed by God. That's what that truth means. You are indwelt by the Spirit. You have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You have the authority of the Holy Spirit. You have the teacher living in you. Paul is saying you must take time to cultivate that knowledge in your life. That's revelation knowledge. You must take time to have revelation of these truths, not just intellectual information, but it must be living information in you. And the way it becomes living information in you, you draw on it. How do you draw on this? You simply talk to the Holy Spirit in your spirit. Thank you. I am enjoyed by God. You feel His presence. You go, whoa. You may not say whoa, but you might. I love talking to the Holy Spirit. I say these things. Holy Spirit, I'm enjoyed by the Father. You can say to the Father on His throne, our Father who art in heaven. You can talk to our Father who art in heaven on His throne, or you can talk to the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. You go either direction. I love to go both directions, but I love to talk to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, the Father enjoys me. Oh, I leave right now just doing it for you. I feel His presence. And the reason I feel his presence, he loves that truth. He loves it. Whenever I say it to him, I feel it. I go, oh, I love this. And I can imagine, he says, I love it more than you love it. I haven't heard him say that, but I imagine it. Numbers of paragraph C. It's the same truth, but it's saying it in the opposite way. To be alive to God is to say the truth positive. To be dead to sin is to say the exact same truth negative. Paul is saying the same way, the same truth from two different angles. Why does he say the same thing twice? Because everybody's personality is different. And you might really connect with, I see myself alive to God. But the other guy might connect with, I see myself alive, dead to sin. Or you might get, really be strengthened by both of those perspectives of the same truth. They are two angles of the same truth. To see myself dead to sin. Beloved, that doesn't mean that sin is dead in me. That's not what it's saying. It's not saying if you try hard enough to envision, you have no anger, no pride, no lust, it will all go away. He's not telling you to go into positive thinking to where if you think, I don't have lust, I don't have lust, I don't have lust, I don't have anger, I, oop, there's my anger. No, he's not saying sin is dead in you. He's saying 
you have died or you are permanently removed from the position you were in of being under the reign of sin the day you were born again you were no longer under the reign of sin now you have a person in you to challenge that angry thought when it rises up now I, I say this several different ways in the notes and I say this much on the on the internet notes because on the internet I have these sermons transcribed like 20 pages and they edit them and they have it all broken down and if you really want to work this out because we only got a few more minutes in this session and you say I'm hungry to know this I want beloved this is essential I mean you can't walk out the eight Beatitudes without this truth when he said you're dead to sin he means the verse right before Romans 6 you're dead which means you're separated which means you're removed from the old position where you were under the mandatory reign of sin that meant when lust or anger came into your emotions you had no supernatural power to draw on that would dissipate that anger you could only grit your teeth and ride out the storm but now when lust rise up you can talk to the Holy Spirit thank you Holy Spirit for peace thank you for love you can say thank you for for self-control any of the nine fruit of the Spirit and that lust will lift if you stay in that dialogue five or ten minutes later that lust might come back but you engage in that dialogue that lust will dissipate again you now have a person in you if you draw on him by talking to him that's how you draw on him you draw on him by talking to him the negative emotion in your soul will dissipate for a few moments or maybe longer when the negative emotion comes back again you talk to the spirit you're alive to God you're free from the reign of sin where you had no ability to challenge those negative emotions now you have a person in you and you can challenge those emotions and they will go away temporarily they will come back but you can you can stand against them again and over time they begin to come less frequently and less powerfully that's called transformation not transportation okay Paragraph F. Paul says it later in Romans. He's talking about the knowing principle here. Now the knowing principle is only one of the three principles. It's not enough by itself. Some people who preach on this subject quite well, they only talk about knowing who you are in Christ. But knowing who you are in Christ is only one of the three. You have to do all three of the principles as a rule of your life for the power to consistently transform you look what he says in Romans 12 you'll be transformed it's talking about your mind and your emotions will be transformed you will think different you will feel different I don't mean a hundred percent all the time but little by little your emotions will change from lustful angry self-pity depression your emotions will experience a transformation but it begins by renewing your mind which one key part of this means you begin to reckon yourself alive to God you see yourself as indwelt by the Spirit and therefore you talk to the Spirit because you're indwelt by him and you thank the Spirit for the truth of who you are that's different than asking the Holy Spirit to make it true you thank him that it is true and those negative emotions will dissipate again temporarily but you do it over and over again your life gets transformed it really is that simple this part it is so simple everyone can do it but it's so simple most people don't do it and they are that homeless beggar under the bridge with a new inheritance and they live in starvation and they never write a check on their new inheritance the way you write a check on this is by thanking the spirit it's true as simple as that I don't mean speak to the air I don't mean to say it's true I thank you it's true out to the nebulous talk to a person it's called abiding in Christ talk. when Jesus said abide in me one way that I rephrase that 
He's saying, talk to me, and I will talk to you. Abide in me, put the word talk to me in the place of abide in me, and you will be on the way to abiding in Christ. Talk to him by the Holy Spirit living in your spirit. Look at paragraph G. Verse 10, Colossians 2. You're complete. You're complete, meaning your legal position is finished. You are accepted by God. You have the authority of Jesus. You have the indwelling spirit, uh, spirit, etc. You're complete. It's done. It can never be improved upon. Now, verse 12, at the end of verse 12, exercise faith in the working of God. Exercise faith faith in these true things about you that you can't feel or see or measure. Exercise faith in the working of God because God gave you all those things even though you can't measure them with your five senses. We believe in them because the Word says them. And if you will draw on them by thanking the Spirit, that is synonymous with exercising faith. And you will have faith in the working of God, which means the Spirit really is in you. You really have the authority of Jesus. When a demon harasses you, you feel depressed in a heightened way. You feel tormented. Don't just ride out the storm. Say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that spirit and I command it to leave. Don't endure oppression. Rebuke it. Not all oppression is directly a demon, but much oppression is directly a demon. It's more complicated than to make it all this or all that. But demons are involved. We can rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Many people, they just, terror will hit them in the night. They'll lay on their bed at night or on their couch. Just a heightened terror will hit them. And they'll just gut it out for like four hours. Why? In the name of Jesus, I command the spirit of fear to leave me now. I mean that. It doesn't leave you. Stay with it. I don't mean raise your voice louder. Just Pull out your badge as that police officer with the whole government behind you. Show your badge. Your badge is the name of Jesus. And again, don't stick your hand out and do that, but it's devil, here's the badge, the name of Jesus. Leave me alone. Spirit of fear, I rebuke you. Go. I tell you, a lot of this is rooted in a demonic attack. Let's look at middle page 37. Principle number two. We have to resist darkness. Now Paul says in each one of these principles, he gives two applications. You'll notice there's, there's two different ways to apply. They're not opposite. There's two different facets of the one principle. Facet is a, probably a better way to say it. He says in verse 12, Do not let sin, he's talking about lust, reign in your body. When you have sexually immoral feelings, and they're real. But it's not limited to sexual immorality. There's many feelings that touch our body that we have to say no to. Notice he says, don't let it rain. He says, you've got to take some responsibility. You have to make the decision, like the farmer, you have to plant the seed and pull the weeds. This is the pulling the weeds. You have to do the farmer's part. God says, I'm not going to plant the seed or pull the weeds. I will provide the supernatural power of the sun and the rain and the life principle in the seed. But farmer, you have to do your part. You must resist the negative emotion that in your our sinfulness it feels pleasurable. That's number one. Verse 13 is facet number two. He says, don't present your members. Your members means your body. But it means more than your physical body. Your members is your emotions. It's your whole person. It's your money. It's all that is yours that goes to making you you. That's your members. He says, don't present your members as vessels of unrighteousness to sin. Now I'll break this down, but I'll give you the summary. We are to resist sin, Satan, and sin-provoking circumstances. That's what verse 13 means. Let's look at B. 
Don't let sin reign. We must resist the evil, the sinful promptings. Then we talk to the Spirit, and we know we're alive to God. So we're talking to the Spirit, but the Spirit saying, I won't resist that for you. You have to resist it. I'll help you. You talk to me, I'll help you. But you have to determine to resist that lustful, that lustful impression. I'll give you supernatural power to make your emotions feel alleviated from the pressure of it temporarily. And if you keep talking to me, I'll keep giving you uh, uh, power, supernatural power, I will release it to alleviate the negative emotion. Again and again and again. I'll do it thousands of times over the course of your life. Millions, maybe. We must, Peter said, abstain from lust that wars against us. The New Testament teaches us lust wars against us. In our society, in our, just our, the principle of sin operating our body, is pulling us to eat wrong, pulling us to express our sexuality wrong, pulling us to use our words wrong, pulling us to vent and to get revenge. And Paul says, and Peter says, don't yield to bitterness, lust, covetousness. Don't yield to those impressions. They're warring against you. And I know some people, in the name of grace, they go, Jesus did it for me. He won't do this part for you, though the Spirit will come alongside you and empower you as you do it, and He will alleviate those negative emotions if you will draw on Him by simply thanking Him for the fruit of the Spirit living in your spirit. Now, I'm saying the same thing over and over. You might say, I don't quite get it. I'm kind of getting it, but I can't, don't quite get it. Th that would be a normal response. If this is new to you, it may take you hearing this a few times. I want to encourage you to get this teaching. It's on the website free and listen to it a few times. We'll have this in a transcription in a few weeks and read through it and think, now what? How does that work again? And work it through line by line, just idea by idea till it's yours. It's not something you heard, it's something you do because you believe it. Then it becomes living understanding. Paragraph 1 under B. Self-denial is an essential New Testament teaching in the grace of God. When I hear people talk about grace and they undermine self-denial and they call it, here's the, remember the code word, legalism. Oh no! Then I won't deny myself. Please don't call me legalism. That's the worst cuss word you can use in the kingdom of God. Legalism. Ah! I'd rather you call me anything besides that. Don't be intimidated by that. Because the New Testament grace requires we deny lust. We have to deny it. The Spirit will help us, and as we talk to Him, He'll help us more. We do it in relationship with the Spirit, but He, he won't do it for us. He won't plant the seeds or pull the weeds for that farmer, but he will produce the miracle process of life. Jesus, Matthew 16, he said you have to deny yourself. You absolutely have to. There is no grace loophole where you don't deny yourself. There is no loophole in the grace of God that we do not deny ourselves of lust. It does not exist. But there is supernatural help for us that we walk with the Spirit through the denying. We're talking to him. We're believing his words. Okay, now look at paragraph C. This is really important. Don't, here's the second facet of the resisting principle. First, we resist the negative emotions, the negative passions. Here's one where many young people make an error. Many young people do. Not just young people, but most of you are young, so that's what I'm talking to. Everybody makes this error, but I think of young people so much. Don't present your body to a sinful circumstance. In other words, don't get in your car, drive across town, get in a setting where you have to rely on your flesh in order to not sin. Paul says, why are you on purpose getting in your car, making the phone call, setting the appointment, driving across town, getting in the context, and that situation will aflame sin in you. It's done it a thousand times, and you keep going back, and then you cry and wonder why you fail. You presented yourself to be inflamed in your desire. Don't do it. 
Don't go to that hotel room. Don't go to that apartment. Don't go to that bar area. Don't go to that party that will inflame sin in you. That's what Paul's talking about. Or wherever, there's a thousand descriptions. You say, well, what about the grace of God? Well, a hundred times you've gone there, and 80 times you've been inflamed, and 60 times you fell. What else do you need? Don't go there. Well, I just, I don't know, you know, I want to live in grace. This is grace. Stay away from a sin inflaming environment. Again, you gone a hundred times, only 20, 80 times you got stirred, 60 times you did something. Say, well, 40 times I didn't do nothing. 60 is disaster. Three is a disaster out of 10. Then you hear the argument. Well, I got to lead them to the Lord. Okay. Jesus went there. Okay. But if you're going to use Jesus as your example, you have to do what Jesus did when he went there. And I don't mean just miracles. You can go anywhere. Listen, here's the rule. That you have the commitment, not just the commitment, you do it. That you will verbalize your commitment to righteousness. If you can go to that place, and they ask you to do A and B, and you say, no. They go, well, I know. I love Jesus, and that's not the way of the kingdom. If you can say that, you can go there. You can't say that, you can't go there. You can't use the Jesus went to the party, but he spoke up with truth, and you be silent on truth and yield to the sin that's in the environment. Principle three. I'm going to bring this to an end. And Luke Wood's going to come out in just a moment. Just let us respond to the Lord for a few minutes. The pursuing principle. Now, I'm going to have you read most of this on your own, the pursuing. Two facets. We present ourselves to God. That's that personal, I love you, God. I read the word to grow in fellowship with you. That's that pursuing the intimate relationship, you and the Lord. Much of it is in this first facet of the pursuing principle. But it doesn't end with you loving God and you reading the word, and you hungering, thirsting to be closer to God. That's facet one. Facet two, paragraph C, you offer your body, your money, your time, your words, your energy. You offer your, your, your members, that's all that you possess. I have that written down there. As an instrument to be used by God to touch other people in the kingdom. The Lord wants us to Walk in love to serve and relate to others. Use your vessel as an instrument to be a communication of the love and power of God to others. Now, don't just think of going down to, on a mission trip. It starts with your family. It starts with your annoying family members that are bothering you. You serve them. You present yourself to God to be a vessel of kindness and service to them even if they annoy you. It starts with your friends at the university. It starts with the people in your church group that bug you. It starts with the people at the office, at the university. Don't think this just means a ministry trip. You can read that on your own. Let's look at the summary. The last two or three minutes. The summary is really important. Here's what we must do. The three principles restated. If we want to walk out the eight Beatitudes by relating to the Holy Spirit, here's what we must do. We must know the truth, who we are. It's more than that, but who we are in Christ is the core point. We must resist darkness. We must pursue God, which always means we pursue people. Because to pursue God who loves people always results in pursuing people. Always. By relating to them, serving to them, humbling ourselves to them, giving them acts of kindness even if we don't like them. Here, I'm going to give the whole paragraph right here in paragraph A. I'm going to summarize the whole teaching. We pursue loving God and people. So underline this, put a star. This is the one key paragraph. We pursue loving God and people. In other words, we pursue. 
as we resist sin, Satan, and sin-provoking circumstances. While we know who we are in Christ, etc. Paragraph B. Very important. None of these three principles in either of their two facets can be omitted. Three principles, two facets each. We cannot omit them. We can't say, I want to know who I am in Christ, but I don't want to resist sin. Another group says, I resist sin, the holiness group, but they might not know who they are in Christ. Another group, I have some examples. Maybe the prayer movement. I will pursue God. I'll go to the prayer room and pursue God, but they won't resist sin outside the prayer room. Or maybe they pursue God in the prayer room. They resist sin outside the prayer room. Well, nowadays you've got to resist sin inside the prayer room because of all the technology that people bring into the prayer room. So now you've got to resist sin in the prayer room too. But they don't know who they are in Christ. They go, I love you, I love you, I love you. Filled with condemnation. When sin rises up in them, they go, ah, I'm dead. I'm, I'm, my life is miserable. The Holy Spirit says, quit saying that. Draw on me. I live in you. I can help you. Oh, I'm just so miserable. I'm so creepy. No, that's not the answer. Know who you are in Christ. So I tell the prayer movement people, don't just worship and cry. Resist sin. Don't just worship and resist sin. Know who you are. Don't just resist sin and worship and know who you are in Christ. Serve people. We got to do the whole thing together. We can't pick and choose in the grace of God the ones that we like and the ones we don't like. If we cooperate with the grace of God in the biblical way, we will walk in the victory that the last half of Romans 6 describes. Amen and amen. Let's stand. Let's stand. Now here's the rule of IHOP. Some of you are new here. When we say the preacher says stand, you don't have to. You never have to, actually. That's one day, the reason I want a bunch of you to is somebody wants to slip out, they can make, make it easy for them. Luke's just going to lead us to respond to the Lord for about 15 or 20 minutes. If you need to slip out, go ahead. But he's going to be here just so you can say, Lord, I want to do this. I want to go all the way. I don't want to be the farmer who asks you to plant the seed and pull the weed. I'm going to do my part because it's the relationship with you that you want me engaged in. So just talk to him about knowing, resisting, and pursuing. Lord, I'm going to do all three of those. I, I, I won't be as consistent as I want, but I'm going to keep signing up when I come up short. That's what you're saying in the next few minutes to the Lord.